Last video, I talked about Taylor series and how to calculate the coefficients to represent a differentiable function as a series. Now I want to do some examples. I want to take familiar functions and express them as Taylor series. Let me start with the exponential function centered at alpha equals zero. What is its series? Well, first I need the pattern of derivatives. This can be a very difficult step in general, but it is very nice for the exponential function since all the derivatives are the same. If I have a pattern of derivatives, I want to evaluate those at the center point. Well, here the pattern is that all derivatives of e to the x are just e to the x, and the center point is alpha, so I evaluate e to the x at alpha, which is 1. Therefore, all of the derivatives evaluate at the center point to just be 1. Then I can make a Taylor series. The form of the Taylor series is the derivative evaluated at the center point divided by the factorial and multiplied by a power of x minus alpha. The derivatives are all 1, so the coefficients are all 1 over n factorial. The center point is 0, so the powers are all just x to the n. This is the Maclaurin series for the exponential function. The radius of convergence, calculated by the limit process described a couple of videos ago, is infinity, so this captures the entirety of the exponential function. This series is the exponential function, it's just a new way of expressing it. I can now answer a question that I asked very near the start of last term. I know that whole numbers and fractional exponents mean something, powers and roots. However, irrational exponents are weird. They don't have a nice interpretation. What is e to the pi? What does it mean? Well, now I can just say that e to the pi means this series. This series for the exponential function evaluated at pi. I now have an interpretation and a way to calculate for strange exponents. The Taylor series, or in this case it's centered at zero, the Maclaurin series, for a function gives me more information about that function and is very useful for actually interpreting and calculating the function. Finally, if this is the exponential function, it must have all the properties of the exponential function. Let me check one of those properties. If I differentiate this series, I differentiate term by term. The n equals zero term goes away as the derivative of a constant. Then the n comes down, the new exponent is n minus one. There is an n over n factorial. So the n cancels with the largest term in the factorial, leaving one over n minus one factorial. Then I can shift this series, adding one to n in the term and subtracting one from n in the bounds is the balancing act. And the result is this, exactly the same series as I started with. The derivative of the exponential function is the same function, and I can see this property reflected in the series representation of the function. And if I didn't know this property, I could also have used the series to prove it. The full algorithm to calculate a series is to find a pattern to the derivatives, evaluate at the center point, and put those values into the form of a series. However, sometimes I can use existing series to build new series without having to use the full algorithm. This is the geometric series. 1 over 1 minus x is expressed as the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of x to the n, at least when the absolute value of x is less than 1. This is radius of convergence r equals 1 around the center point 0. I know I can integrate series, so let me integrate both sides of this. On the left, this is a logarithm integral, and on the right, I integrate with the power rule in each term. I get a constant of integration, but for now, I'll set the constants both equal to zero. The result is a series for the function negative ln of one minus x. For x is in this domain, one minus x is always positive, so I can actually drop the absolute value. Using a series I already knew, I've constructed a Taylor series for this particular logarithm function centered at zero, with radius of convergence r equals 1. Note that the domain of this logarithm is larger than just negative 1 to 1. It is defined for all numbers less than 1. The domain of a Taylor series might not be the whole domain of the original. This is strange, but true. This Taylor series describes the logarithm, but only for a piece of its domain, not its whole domain. For the other pieces of a domain, a different Taylor series, centered at a different center point, might do the trick. Here is another example of using a known series to build a new series. This is the Maclaurin series for the exponential, which I calculated at the start of this video. I can do composition with series. If I replace x with x squared, 
Well, then I get this series. And this is still a series. It just only has even powers of the variable. For the odd powers, this means that they all have coefficients of zero. This is like polynomials. A polynomial doesn't need to have all of its powers. It might skip some. And if it skips some, that implicitly means that those coefficients are zero. So now I have a series for e to the x squared. Well, I can integrate that. And I integrate the series by increasing the exponent by one and dividing by the new exponent. And this is the result. This is a series for the antiderivative of e to the x squared. This is actually quite an accomplishment. You may remember that I said that e to the x squared was an integrable function, but there is no elementary antiderivative. Well, if I use series, that's not a problem. I can make a series antiderivative. The antiderivative of e to the x squared is this series. And this series is some new function. It's not an exponential or a trig or anything else I know. It's something new. But it is the antiderivative of e to the x squared. The ease of integration for series means that I suddenly have access to many of these antiderivatives that previously were mysterious and unavailable. And this is another reason why series are so useful and so valuable. Now let me go back to the full algorithm for calculating Taylor series. I want to calculate the Maclaurin series for the sine function. The coefficients of the derivative of sine evaluated at zero. Well, the derivatives of sine are a nice pattern. Sine, then cos, then negative sine, then negative cos, and then repeat. And if I evaluate those at zero, the pattern is zero, one, zero, negative one, and repeating the loop. The coefficients are then divided by factorials. What do I get out of this? Well, all of the even coefficients will be zero. Each even derivative is sine or negative sine, and all these evaluate to zero at alpha equals zero, the center point. The odd derivatives are one or negative one over the odd factorial, with a sign switching back and forth. How do I write this? Well, to write the evens and the odds, there's a very useful little trick. If n is the index, I can write c2n for the evens and c2n plus 1 for the odds. Then all the evens are 0, so c2n is 0, and all the odds c2n plus 1 are an alternating sign, a power of negative 1, over the factorial 2n plus 1 factorial. I need to be careful with this power of negative 1, but negative 1 to the n works. When n is 0, this is 1, which matches the c1 coefficient. When n is 1, this is negative 1, which matches c3, and so on. This splitting into evens and odds is a pretty common trick, since there are many patterns of coefficients where the evens and odds have two distinct sets of behaviors. This means I can write the Maclaurin series for sine. The coefficients are negative 1 over 2 to the n, or 2n plus 1 factorial for the odd pieces, and the evens are all just 0, so I'll leave them out. And the result is this series. Only the odd powers are written here, and I've matched them up with their coefficients. I could have done something very similar to produce this series for cosine. The coefficients for cosine work the other way around. The evens have alternating signs, and the odds are all zero. So this series only has even terms. Both of these series have infinite radius of convergence, so they both represent sine and cosine for all real numbers. Finally, let me do a series for the logarithm centered at alpha equals 1. Note that I cannot center this logarithm at zero, since zero is not even in the domain of the logarithm. I need the pattern of the derivatives. Well, the first derivative, according to the tables, is 1 over x. Then the higher derivatives are all done by the power rule. The next is negative 1 over x squared, then 2 over x cubed, then negative 6 over x to the 4, and so on. The hardest part of this algorithm is taking the derivatives and trying to recognize a pattern. The sign is changing, so I will need some power of, of negative 1. That power can be n minus 1. The odd terms are positive, and the even terms are negatives, which matches up with negative 1 to the n minus 1. Negative 1 to the n would not match this. It would be the opposite. Then the numerator of those derivatives is multiplying by another number each time, multiplying by 1, and then 2, and then 3, and then 4, and then 5, and so on. And that's building a factorial. So the numerator is going to be a factorial. Well, now I need to be careful with the indices. For the fourth derivative, the numerator is 6, which is 3 factorial, not 4 factorial. So the factorial is 1 less than the index, n minus 1 factorial, not n factorial. 
When building these patterns, I need to be really careful with how I use my indices and how I match patterns. Finally, the denominator is a power of x matching the derivative. The nth derivative has denominator x to the n. Now I have a pattern for the derivatives. I evaluate these at the center point, alpha equals 1, and that puts a power of 1 in each denominator, which has no effect. So the derivatives evaluated at the center point become this pattern, negative 1 to the n minus 1 times n minus 1 factorial. Finally, I put this pattern into the sum, divide by n factorial, and multiply by x minus alpha to the n. Here alpha is 1, so this is centered at 1. And I have factorials in the numerator and denominator, so they cancel off and leave just n in the denominator. This is the Taylor series for the logarithm centered at 1. The radius of convergence calculated by the limit method as before of this is just 1. As before, the domain of the logarithm is all positive numbers, but this series only captures the logarithm between 0 and 2. The series matches up with the function, but only for a piece of its domain. Finally, one last note. I started this series at n equals 1. Why? Well, the pattern only works for n equals 1, since n equals 0 is the original logarithm. But the logarithm evaluates at 1 to 0, so the constant term of this series is 0, which means I can ignore it and start at n equals 1. This video has been examples of taking familiar functions and finding series representations for them. However, in the exponential example, I showed that this could be used to generate completely new functions as well. This is the antiderivative of e to the x squared, a completely new non-elementary function. It turns out that power series are a huge source of new functions. Many, many interesting and useful functions out there are defined by series. Here are just three, four examples. The first is the Bessel functions of order k, and they are written jk, and they have this series. They are alternating series, a bit like sines and cosines, but with stranger denominator two terms, large powers of 2 and strange factorials. The second of these are called the Bessel-Clifford functions, again depending on parameter k, and the third of these are called the polylogarithm functions, which are an extension of the idea of logarithms and look a little bit like the zeta function. Again, these are but a few examples of a whole universe of Taylor series functions in mathematics.